Well, thank you very much, Augustin, and uh, good morning to, to you all. As Augustin mentioned, macroprudential frameworks have become a key new element of the post-crisis financial reforms designed to ensure financial stability. This is very welcome. As you know, while the concept of macroprudential regulation and supervision goes back to the 1970s and was refined in the early 2000s, it became popular only post-crisis, thanks in part to the support of the G20. This graph, tracing the increase in the number of press articles mentioning the term macroprudential, underlines the point. There were hardly any articles before 2008, and they surged thereafter. In my remarks today, based on a special chapter of the annual report, I would like to take stock of where we stand in the implementation of the frameworks and suggest a way forward. This is a particularly good time to do so, since macroprudential measures can play a key role in supporting monetary policy along its normalization path, enhancing its room for maneuver. The window of opportunity should not be missed. A couple of clarifications before I start. First, I will define macroprudential frameworks as the use of primarily prudential tools to target specifically systemic risk and mitigate its macroeconomic costs. Thus, the macroprudential approach to regulation and supervision differs from the more traditional microprudential one, which focuses on the assessment of the risks institutions face on a standalone basis, and with little regard for the financial system as a whole or the macroeconomy. Second, I will focus only on the so-called time dimension and leave out the cross-sectional or structural dimension. The time dimension addresses how systemic risk evolves over time. The key concept here is the pro-cyclicality of the financial system, that is, its tendency to amplify financial expansions and contractions, which in turn can amplify business fluctuations. The financial cycle is a reflection of such forces. By contrast, the cross-sectional dimension addresses how risk is distributed in the financial system at a given point in time. In particular, it focuses on common exposures and interlinkages. Think, for instance, of capital surcharges for global, systemically important banks or of central counterparties. There are three takeaways from my presentation. First, we should not underestimate the intellectual shift macroprudential frameworks have brought about in how to ensure financial stability. This is now taken for granted, but its influence goes way beyond regulation and supervision. Second, substantial progress has been made, but more needs to be done. The best way forward is to combine ambition in implementation with realism as to what we should expect the frameworks can achieve on their own. And finally, to ensure financial stability and hence sustainable growth, macroprudential measures should be embedded in more holistic macrofinancial stability frameworks. The frameworks, in addition to prudential policies, also involve monetary, fiscal, and even structural policies. And I will take each point in turn. So the intellectual shift first. We now take it for granted. It has become, as it were, part of the furniture. But the conception of risk brought about by the macroprudential approach differs markedly from the one prevailing pre-crisis. Admittedly, this conception is an old one, but it had largely gone out of fashion during the heady atmosphere of the so-called Great Moderation. At the time, as illustrated in this graph, left-hand panel, it seemed obvious that risk is low in a boom and high in a bust. But as illustrated in the right-hand panel, the macroprudential approach turned this dictum on its head, stating that risk builds up in a boom and materializes in a bust, so that what we see in a bust or recession is simply the result of what precedes it. The prevailing notion at the time was rooted in the idea that as a result of unforeseen or exogenous shocks, the economy switched from states of expansion and contraction and then swiftly returned to equilibrium. By contrast, the macroprudential conception 
saw the economy as evolving in response to self-reinforcing endogenous forces that might take it away from equilibrium. And it was the prevailing notion of the time that hindered the recognition of the risk buildup ahead of the great financial crisis. Now things have changed radically, very much informed by that experience. This is illustrated in these graphs, which trace the behavior of key variables around the great financial crisis denoted by the shaded area. As the left-hand panel indicates, unusually strong increases in credit, the red, the red line, and asset prices, the blue line, that is a financial cycle boom, are now taken as a sign of growing risk, not of a healthy expansion. And as shown in the right-hand panel, highly compressed spreads, red line, and subdued volatility, the black line, are now taken as a sign of high risk-taking, not of low risk. To be sure, one may legitimately wonder whether this fundamental intellectual shift has been sufficiently embedded in the current vintage of macroeconomic models. Personally, I doubt it. The issues are inherently complex. But it has definitely spread to other policy areas, including monetary policy. That all of this is taken for granted is simply testimony to how entrenched the intellectual shift has become. For instance, as indicated in this graph, which traces mentions in the press, alongside the term macroprudential, the term financial cycle, blue bars, has become increasingly familiar. This intellectual shift is extremely welcome and probably the major gain. Let me now turn to the assessment of the implementation of macroprudential frameworks. Post-crisis, we have been gaining considerable experience with them, including with the identification of risks, the deployment of tools, the impact of the measures, and governance arrangements. In all of these areas, substantial progress has been made. Let me just mention a few points about each. You can read more about them in the chapter. Identifying the buildup of risks remains a challenge. But the authorities can now rely on a broad range of tools. These include aggregate early warning indicators of possible stress a few years in advance, typically based on the notion of the financial cycle, banking system-wide or financial system-wide stress tests, so-called macro stress tests, and more qualitative analysis based on a wide array of information. What are the key takeaways from the experience so far? One is that there is a need to regard the aggregate analysis only as a starting point for more refined and comprehensive assessments. For instance, looking at how debt burdens are distributed across the population of households and firms. Another takeaway is that macro stress tests are helpful, but they have their limitations. In fact, none of them identified the serious risks ahead of the great financial crisis. Technical difficulties in capturing second round effects loom large, not least as a result of the limitations of current macro models that I mentioned earlier. Thus, if improperly used, macro stress tests could even foster a false sense of security. By contrast, they have proved much better as devices to enforce the required recapitalization after crisis. Moreover, stressing balance sheets has proved useful in calibrating tools such as maximum loan to value ratios or debt service to income ratios. Second, deploying the instruments is subject to a number of constraints of a technical as well as political economy nature. For instance, vulnerabilities build up only very slowly so that there is a high risk of being seen as crying wolf or, of, or as taking unnecessary measures. And the near-term costs are obvious, at least to some interest groups, while the long-term benefits, although very large, are hard to measure, even ex post. Still, while the risk of an inaction bias is real, it has not prevented the more frequent use of the measures. This is shown in this graph. We see that the number of measures has tended to increase, the bars get larger, especially in advanced economies, but that they're more frequently used in emerging market economies. The blue bars are larger than the red bars. Third, naturally, most of the instruments are very useful in building up buffers, and hence the financial system's resilience. This is what they do best. By contrast, they differ in their ability to restrain the growth in credit and asset prices. 
In particular, maximum loan-to-value ratios and debt service-to-income ratios have proved to have a larger and more discernible effect on, say, count than, say, countercyclical provisions or the countercyclical capital buffer. This is illustrated in this graph. In the right-hand panel, the light blue bars for provisions and the countercyclical capital buffer indicate that their impact is not statistically significant. This result has also been confirmed by policymakers' own assessment of their experience. And it contrasts with the impact of loan-to-value and debt service-to-income ratios. The dark blue bars in the left-hand panel indicate that the impact is both economically and statistically significant. In addition, macroprudential instruments in general have some limitations. Most of the tools so far apply only to the banking sector. They can leak, that is, they are subject to regulatory arbitrage, both within and across countries, possibly pushing activity into the darker corners of the financial system. And at least as used so far, they have not necessarily prevented the emergence of the familiar signs of financial imbalances for instance, in the form of outsized credit growth. This is illustrated in this graph. The graph indicates that the use of the tools, blue bars, did not prevent credit growth from exceeding long-term averages by a large margin. If you look closely enough, you will see that the red line, which refers to the credit gap, is above the dotted horizontal line, which refers to the ceiling for the activation of the countercyclical capital buffer in Basel III, that is the highest threshold indicating that credit is running hot. The implications? All this suggests that it is desirable to better identify risks and calibrate macroprudential tools accordingly, to develop more tools that target the non-bank sector, such as asset managers and capital markets more generally, to consider implementing further mechanisms to address cross-country leakages, analogous to the reciprocity clauses in the countercyclical capital buffer, and to complement macroprudential measures with other policies. And I will come back to this point in a moment. Finally, there is no one-size-fits-all in governance arrangements, which vary a lot across countries. As this graph shows, the most common arrangement is a committee bringing together various authorities, the blue segments of the two bars on the far left. The second most common is entrusting the central bank with the responsibility for both the regulation and supervision of individual institutions and for macroprudential measures. Next set of bars from the left. In general, central banks play a prominent role, making them even more essential for financial stability. Now, so far the experience with governance arrangements has been mixed. For instance, in a BIS survey of central banks, they've, the results have suggested that coordination through interagency committees has not always worked well. In passing, let me also make a point regarding the need for policymakers' autonomy in this area. My sense is that in crisis prevention, as opposed to crisis management, the need for autonomy from the government has been underestimated. True, compared with an inflation-oriented monetary policy, the measures have more obvious distributional effects. And the objective is indeed fuzzier. But the lag between actions and the effects on the ultimate goal is longer. And there is hardly any constituency against the inebriating feeling of getting richer during a boom. Thus, taking away the proverbial punch bowl is, if anything, even harder than in monetary policy. My bottom line from all this, if we are to make further progress in implementing macroprudential frameworks, we need a pragmatic mix of ambition and realism. Ambition to develop tools further, to target them better, to overcome any inaction bias, and where needed, to coordinate internationally. Realism to understand the tools and frameworks limitations and hence not to entertain overly optimistic expectations about what they can do on their own. This naturally brings me to my last point, the need to embed macroprudential frameworks in a broader macrofinancial stability framework involving other policies. The framework represented in this graph includes not only macroprudential measures underpinned by strong microprudentially oriented 
regulation and supervision of individual institutions, but also monetary, fiscal, and even structural policies. This should have two advantages. First, ensuring a more balanced policy mix so as not to overburden macroprudential measures. And second, improving the chances of achieving lasting financial and macroeconomic stability and hence more sustainable growth. The precise balance between the various policies is still subject to debate. More analysis is needed. Since we have already discussed the role of these policies in some detail in previous annual reports, let me here just mention a few key points. The role of monetary policy is still quite controversial. It is generally agreed that monetary policy and macroprudential measures interact closely that monetary policy can affect the buildup of financial imbalances. After all, it operates partly by influencing credit, asset prices, and risk-taking. And that monetary policy can complement macroprudential measures because it can reduce leakages, since its influence is much more pervasive. But views about its role differ. They depend on the degree to which one considers macroprudential measures and microprudential measures sufficient to ensure financial stability, as well as on assessments of any collateral damage that monetary policy may have. Clearly, the room to use monetary policy increases once central bank anti-inflation credibility is established. This is because, at a minimum, a more financial stability-oriented monetary policy requires a certain tolerance for deviations of inflation from objectives and a lengthening of the policy horizon. Moreover, using monetary policy involves not only interest rates, but also foreign exchange intervention. Just as with other macroprudential tools, leaning with foreign exchange intervention can help build up precautionary buffers in good times, so as to run them down in bad times. And it may also help constrain the buildup of imbalances, at least as long as market participants do not perceive it as providing insurance. The role of fiscal policy, too, is multifaceted. The tax code can be used to influence credit and asset prices. In particular, it would be very helpful to reduce the tax bias that typically favors debt over equity. In addition, it is important to ensure sufficient fiscal space to address any crisis that might materialize. As we know, the sovereign's balance sheet is the ultimate backstop for the financial sector. Ensuring fiscal space requires full recognition of the flattering effect that financial booms have on the fiscal accounts, obscuring their underlying strength. Finally, structural policies can help too. For instance, regulations that artificially constrain land supply can amplify property price booms and busts. And more generally, inflexible labor and product markets reduce an economy's resilience to macroeconomic downturns. To sum up, the intellectual shift in the conception of risk macroprudential frameworks have brought about is extremely welcome and probably the most enduring gain. Substantial progress has been made in implementing the frameworks, but challenges remain. And addressing those challenges will require action well beyond the bounds of the macroprudential sphere itself. Thank you. Thank you.